Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome again to this week's study, the Wednesday edition. As we return to the document before us, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his direction and for his guidance, so that we might more clearly understand that which we need to know at this time. Shall we now ask for his counsel in prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we have all sinned. We have all fallen short of your glory. We need you to direct us. We need you as we open your word, as we consider these subjects, especially at the time in which we are living. Guide us now. May your spirit open our minds. May your angels be with us to protect us so that we may remain on the path that is to be before us. Help us to these ends. Be with us today so that we may learn better as to how to praise and honor you. Direct us now, Father, in your path. For this, we thank you. For this, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Now, verse 14 is what we're going to consider today. As it is written, and in those times there shall stand up against the king of the south. There shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also, the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the calzone, but they shall fall. Now, the margin reading of this verse would read, And in those times shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also, the children of the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the calzone which is concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation, but they shall fall. I think it's important that we understand that these children of the robbers of thy people are to establish both the daily and the transgression of desolation. Any thought or comment? Well, yeah. So one of the things that I started talking about yesterday And then William brought up um, uh, Daniel 8, verse 17, and the fact that Strong's Concordance has a typo in the original hardcover edition that doesn't exist on ESORG, and uh, that it has the word in 8.17. Go back to there. While, while Um, While you're looking for that, I'm going to interject. Please be aware, yes. I have noted that Strong's, depending on the year in which the book was published, are going to have multiple changes. So Strong's is historically one that will publish an edition and then come out and make a change in a later edition. Yeah, now, um, I mean, the one I had, obviously, was... Uh, you know, the 1970 edition, from the 1970s. I don't know what year the edition was. Um, But yeah, you won't find those typos in any editions now, the newer editions. They have corrected that. But it says Mara in 817 in the old Strongs that I had that everybody had back back then. Um, But it's actually the zone, right? 2377. And now I noticed the mistake because um, I had an interlinear and, um, you know, you can see it says Kazon in Hebrew. So, you know, it, it it was just, a, I don't, I think part of the reason why is because you have Mara at the end of the preceding verse, 816. And then, so when you move down to the next verse, somehow you just put in Mara again instead of Kazon. It's almost the same same thing so uh, let me see here so um now we we took note that this was uh 817 backwards it would be 718 july 18 and then i talked about i I mentioned about uh jephthah and the shibboleth and there was this diagram that i had done where i show uh the connection between 911 and 119 with the, in the story of Jephthah, but the point was Shibboleth plus the name Jephthah adds up to 
1957, which is 30 years from November 9th, 2019, or from 2000, from 1989 to 2019. So that 30 year period that we have for this movement, which symbolizes the priests. So I just wanted to mention that because I'd started mentioning it. I, I listened to the video again. And I realized I never finished that statement. Um, but the symbolism that we have in these numbers uh, becomes really important. It was interesting last night. We had a prayer meeting. And um, uh, the first thing that was read was uh, from Evangelism, uh, page 252, and the second thing we read was from evangelism, but it was um, from a uh, test. No, let me see. So it was a, from evangelism. No, it wasn't. It was in the book evangelism, for, but it was from uh, fifth fifth testimonies, page 252. And um, so I just want to share this because this was really interesting. It's going to relate to what we're studying what we talked about yesterday and it, it yeah it's quite interesting little uh anyway i don't know if this is the one there's the one in early writings as well that we read i probably should have got this already beforehand uh, but then the other thing we read was from um uh, october it was from review and herald i believe october 13th 1892, if I remember correctly. I'm going to have to look those up. I should probably look these up and share them a bit later. I get them all ready. But, um, and, and then it was from, we also had, what was the other one? There was another statement from early writings. Anyway, it was very, very interesting. So I'm going to have to get those statements together. But um, the, the point here is there was these symbolisms uh, that we have. And, and it wasn't intentional. I wasn't the one leading out on on, uh, on the prayer meeting, Felix. So he didn't really look at these beforehand, like as far as the, the symbols. And so when we have a symbol like this in uh, Daniel 8, 17, uh, we need to take note of it, that, it, that it, especially as we're studying this now, and, and the application there is it relates to this movement into July 18th. And so the significance that we had yesterday that we discussed was these visions, right? So we had, we said that the Kazon is shown in Daniel 7, right? Correct. Even though, even though it's in Aramaic. And then in Daniel chapter 8, he's going to be in, in verse 17. He's going to be Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. And in the verse before that, it says, make this man understand the vision. So the vision that he's going to be made to understood is going to be the Mara. And so we're saying that that represents the second angel's message. And the Kazon represents the first angel's message. And then, but in order to understand the second angel's message, he has to understand the first angel's message, right? He has to understand the kazoo. For at the time of the end shall be the kazoo, right? In page 17. Now we know the second angel's message is repeat in our history. And so the Mara, Mara is the one in Daniel 8, Mara, that make this man to understand the vision. Right. It's going to be the kazoo that helps him to understand that. And in our history, we're repeating that second angel's message, but it's the Mara, right? The looking glass vision, which relates to a mirror. And we can say it's the prophetic mirror, right? It's, it, it's including the Mara, right? Which ends in 1844. And also, obviously, the, the Kazoo. And then... Uh, we're saying that Daniel 9 has the debar. Now, the debar is not a word for vision. It's word, commandment, or matter. Um, and I'm suggesting that that really relates to the third angel's message. And when Samuel Snow was presenting the midnight cry, which is going to show 
the end of the 2300 days that's on the 10th day of the seventh month right but he's going to use the 70 weeks to help him understand this right so that's going to be um his may 2nd uh letter that's published on may 2nd we don't know the date he, he wrote it it's published on may 2nd in 1844 and it's the center of a chiasm right it's the center of his letters and and of course uh, it's on Passover and the topic of the letter is the midst of the week the Passover in 31 AD so it, it represents a mirror in and of itself but in our history which is the repeat of history the fourth angel's message we're saying that that's Daniel chapter 10 that's the Marah so we have the prophetic mirror in our history which joins the third angel and it has has it not has has not that happened with with what's happened with 9 11 so we're saying the mighty angel of revelation 18 comes down this is representing our history the second angel's message joins with the third and it's given us an understanding of the week of christ prophetically right that, that we've made this application but it's giving us this looking glass vision that is it's completing the the, the three angels messages in our history uh, is is that making sense to people i don't know if people spent time thinking about it since yesterday but this is a new thought yesterday and so sometimes when there's a new idea it's we have to refine it in order to explain it so i don't know if we wanted to continue. Any thoughts on that? I was considering other items, so I can't really say that 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 was part of what I was doing yesterday. So, yeah, okay. Well, we're going to have to consider it now because because I think this is major. Uh, it's it's a major uh, insight, but whether we understand you know the importance of it, whether other people see anything about it. That's the, you know, I can't I can't tell you what you're thinking. What right. Other people are thinking. But but we should be able to see that this that this this is I think the whole point, right? It's not just like some side little side issue. Uh, for one, it does help us to understand that the judgment passes to the living when the mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down. Now. There's some of this, this, these ideas that people have. Let's say, you know, you talk about the close of probation. Now, the close of probation is not an arbitrary event, right? When God closes probation, he's just declaring what is. Right? He's making a declaration that something that is, is. Correct? All right. Okay. People have made their choice. So he then closes the door. And... But some people almost put a mystical importance to it, sort of like God just does it arbitrarily, and then you're all of a sudden just going to be righteous because God declared you righteous, and the wicked are going to be wicked because God declared them wicked. But it's not arbitrary. It's it's just what is. There's not something mystical attached to it. And, and people will do the same thing with, um, you know, the loud cry or the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. These these are attached to messages, right? So it's the messages that do their work. So when we talk about the judgment of the living, the reason that the judgment passes to the living is because light has come that actually begins that work of judging the living. Does that make sense? And considered in that way before. Yeah. So we just come into a time in which the living are now being judged because of certain light. And that is, you know, that it's the sealing message or whatever you want to call it. So there's going to be this, this revelation of, of God's character that is, um, and in here, and I see if I can find this statement. So I found, uh, I found five testimonies, 252. Yeah, here it is. There is altogether too little of the spirit and power of God in the labor of the watchmen. 
the spirit which characterized that wonderful meeting on the day of Pentecost is waiting to manifest its power upon the men who are now standing between the living and the dead as ambassadors for God. The power which stirred the people so mightily in the 1844 movement will again be revealed. The third angel's message will go forth, not in whispered tones, but with a loud voice. So this is 5T 252.2. And there's no symbolism there at all. Well, yeah, well, there is, of course, as because you're speaking um, ironically. So we got 5252. Right, so you got the 525, and you got the 252, and of course we have the point two there, which is just another part of that 252. And uh, so we got the 2520 symbolism there. And and the message there, right, so you know, Felix just picks this, he's you know interested in what it says, he doesn't think about the page, and it's in evangelism that he finds it, but it gives this reference. Now, um, so I, I thought that was very profound in the context of what we just had studied yesterday, right? Dealing with this message of the Mara, which is our history. It is, now we had discussed, you know, what is the testing message? Now, I believe that there is a testing message that comes to the people of God, right? Right, in every age there is, there's uh, a new, uh, what's the word uh, that she uses? Not revelation of truth, but an unfolding of truth is not the right word. Um, but there's a message to the people of God for every generation, right? Correct. And, and so we know that, that this movement has had a test. And, that, and that's going to relate to, um, to review and Herald article, if I can find it. because. When we look at October 13th in this movement, uh, 2018, what what did we call October 13th? What, what was it, what was it initially back in 2018? I'm not remembering that far back. Okay. Yeah, so we were looking at it as the midnight cry for the priests. Okay. Okay. So that was that was the idea. This was the midnight cry, and um, so. We know that on October 3rd, Tess had presented uh, two studies. One was called 10, 10 Days or 10 Years, and the other one was called um, The Midnight Cry. And so it was 10 days later that The Midnight Cry was given. Now, of course, that was a zoomed in line, right? That was not really, uh, because what we're going to have is we're going to have a close of probation for the priest, that is for the false priest, 391 and a half days after the midnight cry is given, right? So, so when I count that 391 and a half days, that's going to uh, uh, be connected to, try to remember the year of October 13th, what was the year of that one? I, I, I didn't remember the year, I thought it was 1892, but maybe it was wrong. But October 13th, Review and Herald article. So I have to do it this way. Okay, there's lots of October 13th. Now, so so anyway, we think about our history. In our history, we have this repeat of history. As she says, the third angel's message is going to be revealed, is the word she uses. So we can see that um, that's, in a sense, we could just say that's repeated. Um, so here I'm going to find this statement in Angeles, and that's going to be the only way I'm going to do it. So sorry about that, that I didn't uh, get this set up. So it is in uh, Review and Herald 1904, October 13th, 1904. I don't know why I thought it ended in the two. So this statement here, so we have this October 13th statement. Here's what Felix picked. It says, during the loud cry, the church, aided by the providential interpositions of her exalted Lord, will diffuse the knowledge of salvation so abundantly 
that light will be communicated to every city and town. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of salvation. So abundantly will the renewing spirit of God have crowned with success the intense, um, the intensely active agencies that the light of present truth will be seen flashing everywhere. That's pretty interesting. So any thoughts on those statements? So we got this 252 symbol, we have the October 13th symbol that just happens to be what we had in our prayer meeting last night. But both of them have attached not just symbols, but the significance of what they're stating. Because we're saying that uh, the midnight cry parallels the loud cry, right? That's, that's what she has said in the previous statement. And then we see this here in this October 13th, 1904 Review and Herald article. And, and the title of the article is called The Closing Work. So she starts out, you know, we shall see before us a special work to be done. We are now to pray as never before for the Holy Spirit's guidance. Let us seek the Lord with the whole heart that we may find him. We have received the light of the three angels' messages. And we need now to come decidedly to the light. And take our position on the side of truth. The 14th chapter of Revelation is a chapter of the deepest interest. This scripture will soon be understood in all its bearings, and the messages given to John the Revelator will be repeated with distinct utterance. Right? The prophecies of the 18th of Revelation will soon be fulfilled. During the proclamation of the third angel's message, another angel is to come down from heaven having great power, and the earth is to be light, lighted with his glory. The Spirit of the Lord will so graciously bless consecrated human instrumentalities that men, women, and children will open their lips in praise and thanksgiving, filling the earth with the knowledge of God and with his unsurpassed glory as the waters cover the sea. So it's just an amazing coincidence that the thing that we studied yesterday, dealing with these messages, first, second, third, and the second coming again, which we call the fourth angel, are presented to us in these two statements from evangelism, which is quoting from Five Testimonies 252 and October 13th, 1904. I, I don't know what people think about that. Do, do we find this as significant for us now in what God is doing because we talked about what a testing message is. And, and we know that, that this message in some way is attached to a testing message for Seventh-day Adventists. But it's because there is going to be light being poured out to everyone, right? It's going to be spreading out to the world, to every city and town, right? To every individual, light is going to be given. Okay, the the other thing that's of interest to me is, as you've been going through this, mm -hmm. the article published in the Review and Herald, as you're pointing out, went out the 13th of October of 1904. Yeah. And on the biblical calendar, it would have been the second day of the seventh month. Okay. So we're talking about the the preceding symbolically of the day of atonement yeah so it's it's the second day after rosh hashanah right yeah okay now i'm also i'm also looking just to get an idea it to me it's intriguing that during mrs white's lifetime the phrase closing work was published 166 times okay. in, mul in multiple documents and in multiple books which is ffa backwards right so yeah because six percent staff so you got the ffa symbolism there okay interesting yeah so but we take these statements so we, we look at what happened yesterday so that's why it's, it's so significant so we have our study you know yesterday i guess Depends what you call yesterday. <laughs> Depends where you are. But, um, you know, so last night for me, previous night at 
you know, we have that study, 1130 here, and then, and then we have the prayer meeting, and we have these things come together. I'd spent a bit of time thinking about this, how I would uh, present this to people and, and the significance of it. But, but I, I think that we have to look at it this way, that we have these four visions. And, um, and the symbolism of the three angels' messages in the touches as well. So the touches are going to be in chapter uh, 8, 9, and 10. We don't have a touch in Daniel 7, right? So when Daniel has the vision of the four beasts, it's going to be 2, 3, 7, 6 because it's in Aramaic, but it's also going to be a dream. So he's going to use the word dream. I had a dream and visions of my head upon my bed. And he's going to see that see this vision, right? Now then he's going to be behold until he let me see where is it here he's going to see the ancient of days so he's going to see the judgment beginning right so this is the first angel's message fear god give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and then uh, chapter eight is going to give us the mar mara 2300 days which is going to uh, be the second angel's message it's it's going to be proclaimed by samuel snow but then the third angel's message, we're going to say, is attached to the midst of the week, the cross, right? That, that's going to be that. Now, when we look at that uh, Daniel chapter 9, we know that Daniel chapter 9 is the 70 weeks, and the 70 weeks are going to begin in 457 B.C. And in 457 B.C., we have two chiasms, one that points to the Pentecost, and one that points to the Day of Atonement, right? And the Pentecost one is going to show that this, that because it's dealing with the start of the 70 weeks, it's dealing with things that address the 70 weeks. And in, on the Day of Pentecost is when Christ begins his work as our intercessor in the most holy, or in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, right? When the Holy Spirit is poured out on the Day of Pentecost. And so we're saying that that's going to mark when Christ begins his work in the holy place, we know that his work in the holy place ends October 22nd, 1844, right? So on the 10th day of the seventh month. So in 457 BC, you have this Pentecost, which marks the beginning of Christ's work in the holy place. And October 22nd, 1844, the 10th day of the seventh month, that marks his closing of his work in the holy place. And of course, when he begins his, his, when he closes his work in the holy place, he begins his work in the most holy, but he's going to begin with the judgment of the dead, the righteous dead, correct? Okay. Now, why is it the judgment of the righteous dead? Now, we know it's the judgment of the righteous because it's the work in the sanctuary, and the wicked, their sins don't go into the sanctuary to be cleansed, right? It's only confessed sins. So, so why is it that the judgment, why is there this separation of the judgment of the dead and the living? Again, it's not some arbitrary thing that God is doing. The judgment of the righteous, there's provision made, but there is no provision made for the judgment of the wicked, meaning provision for right, being right. saved. Yeah. Well, it's That's not the so main much difference provision. The it doesn't state. have to do with provision. This doesn't have to do with provision because Christ died for all men. Mm -hmm. But we're talking about uh, yeah. it has to do with the confession of sins. Why sins, sins that go into the sanctuary. So in the daily uh, ministry, right, in, in the holy place, not the day of atonement, but in, in what happens on, on the day by day, Sins are being brought to the sanctuary. They're being confessed, right? So it's just in symbols. This is in types. And but there comes the day of atonement. In the day of atonement, there is then a cleansing of the sanctuary, right? So this isn't about uh, you know the provision made for salvation. This is about the cleansing of the sanctuary. It's a message, right? It represents a message. Okay, so. But it's going to start with the dead. It doesn't just start with the dead and the living, right? It's going to start with the dead. And 
and, and a lot of people, you know, criticize Adventism because of this this judgment, you know, investigative judgment and so forth. It's one of the, the big issues. But that's partly because it's not explained well and partly because people aren't really interested in knowing the truth. Because even many Adventists don't understand it. Um, I would say almost no Adventists understand it. But so it's not some arbitrary events, right? Because the judgment of the judgment begins because there is a message that proclaims the judgment. But it can't be the judgment of the living yet because a message has not been proclaimed that can judge the living, right? Mm-hmm. That, because it's dealing with the cleansing of the sanctuary. What happens in heaven happens on earth. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, right? Christ begins to work, even when you look at when Christ begins his work in the holy place, it's because of what's happening on earth. Can Christ begin his work in the holy place before the Holy Spirit is poured out on the day of Pentecost? Say that again? Can Christ begin his work in the holy place in 31 AD before the Holy Spirit is poured out on the day of Pentecost? No, he cannot. Right, he can't. Right? Why not? Work of judgment? Right. And of course, well, that's not judgment. It has to do with a message. It has to do with what's happening on earth and heaven are connected. Right? Because now some morning, people... You know, can you repeat that? that? Can you repeat that again? Repeat what? What you said earlier. About, about the Holy Spirit being poured out on the day of Pentecost. Can Christ begin his work? Yeah, can you... In, well, that, that's what I'm going to explain. Right. So I don't know. If I, I'll, I'll, I'll just. So if we think about the sanctuary, we know because we study this in the Friday night studies when we were dealing with E.J. Wagner, he rejects the investigative judgment because Christ died before the foundations of the world. And and so this idea of an investigative judgment when salvation's always been available. Uh, doesn't make sense to him. But that's because he doesn't understand how a message that's given on earth is connected to what happened in heaven. So people have been saved long before Jesus dies on the cross, which he doesn't take into account. But of course, he tries to say, well, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. But there comes a time when the cross becomes present truth, right? That's because Jesus actually comes and dies on the cross. He was promised, you know, at the, at, at the foundation of the world. And so he is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. But there still comes a time in history when Jesus actually dies. And that doesn't mean that the people before he dies on the cross don't have salvation offered to them. Obviously, they do. And we could say, just as Christ is, you know, slain from the foundation of the world, you know, Judgment is from the foundation of the world. I mean, all of these things are promised, but they have a time in which they come into history. So his work in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary has to happen because there is a progression of events on earth that illustrate this work of salvation. That is, there is a reform line. There's a reform line right from Eden to Eden. Right? There's a reform line in the life of Christ. There's a reform line in the sanctuary itself, both the earthly and the heavenly. And all of these things are tied together. All of these lines that we are doing, all of these prophetic periods, they're all symbolizing this work, the three angels' messages, the three-step testing prophetic message that develops and demonstrates two classes of worshipers. So because there is a message, because Christ comes and dies on the cross, and then he's resurrected three days later. And then, you know, 40 days after his resurrection, he ascends into heaven. Then 10 days after that, the Holy Spirit is poured out, right? And only then does he begin his daily ministration, correct? Correct. And the, and the 70 weeks, il- yeah, yeah. And the 70 weeks illustrate this. It, it illustrates it at the beginning with. Uh, in 457, and it occurs in the midst of the week with Christ's death and all of these events, that's 50 days. And we know that that um, week of that, that um, uh, the week of Christ is 
is 2520 plus 50 days if we do an inclusive count. It's 2570 days, right? So it has built into it that 50 days plus 2520 days, right? So that significance from of those 50 days of the Pentecost symbolism is built into the week of Christ structure along with the 2520. It's also, of course, produces the prophetic mirror. So in, in our history, we have this, the 70 weeks, the week of Christ uh, being connected with Christ is going to commence his work in the holy place and end his work in the holy place in connection with the message regarding the 70 weeks, right? Or the, if that makes sense to people. So that's the third angel's message. But it's going to be joined with the second angel's message, the prophetic mirror. In our history, then, we can say that uh, our history is representative by the Mara, the looking glass vision, the prophetic mirror. It's, it's the message that addresses the closing work, a loud cry. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, it's making, making sense. Yeah. So, okay. the message that we, yeah. so the message that we have been given, well, okay, wait, you, you are. No, I was I was gonna I, I was gonna throw a little gas on the fire. Okay. How often have we gone through the importance of the symbols? Now, in this situation, you bring up an article that, as you point out very correctly, was published on the thirteenth of October of nineteen oh four. An article with the same name was also published by Mrs. White on the eleventh excuse me, on the 28th of November of 1906. They are both published as the closing work. Yeah. Now, we have, we have just noted symbolically that the first document referenced was on the second day of the seventh month. Yeah. The second document so noted... <clears throat> on the biblical and rabbinic calendars both is published on the 11th day of the ninth month. Okay, so you so have 9-11. So you have 9-11. Okay. The, oh, time of, <laughs> the time of duration between the publishment of the two letters inclusive is 777 days. Okay. <laughs> Now, yeah. does this mean anything to us? Yes. Okay. So, so what we have <laughs> um, is, you know, we first have that that two fifty two symbolism of that one statement, but then this October thirteenth one, and and uh, is is extremely important article, and um, in what it says relates to what we've been studying dealing with the loud cry and the three angels' messages. Um, And it has the symbol of October 13th. So we know October 13th is the day that Babylon fell, right, or the night, uh, in uh, uh, 539 B.C. So it has that symbolism attached to it. It's also, there's counterfeits to it as well. We know it's connected to the miracle of uh, Fatima. Right. Right. Um, But that's at noon instead of midnight. And then uh, it's also the date my brother died in uh, 1990. Um, But, you know, here we have it attached with 777 days, and it's attached uh, to 9-11, right? That is, um, we have that. uh, The date there was. That's pretty awesome, man. Well, especially. Yeah. When, when you're throwing in that symbol of FFA. Yeah, you have the FFA symbol, and then you have uh, the 777 inclusive days, so 776. Now, we know, you know, November 9th, <clears throat> 1989 to December 25th, 1991 is 777 inclusive days. In our history, from uh, uh, 
2019 to December 25th, we, we have 777 cardinal days, but but they, they're still the same symbol, right? So it's still right. 777. But we have this here connected to the 911 symbol. 911, of course, we've already connected to 119. So that, to me, this is beyond uh, coincidence, right? It's not just some minor coincidence. We have these two October 13th articles. Now they're not identical articles. They are they're not. Just, um, so they're different. Okay. So. Yeah, I got something for you. There's something for you here that yeah. I found interesting. Uh, first selected messages, page 363. Uh, the beginning of the light of the angel whose glory shall fill the whole. Oh, this is the beginning of the righteousness by faith message. For it is the work of everyone to whom the message of warning has come to lift up Jesus, to present him to the world as revealed in types, as shadowed in symbols, as manifested in the revelations of the prophets, as unveiled in the lessons given to his disciples and in wonderful miracles wrought for the sons of men. Search the scriptures for they, for are they that testify of him. But I thought that was interesting. Uh, as revealed in types, as shattered in symbols, as manifested in the revelations of the prophets and the lessons of it to the, his disciples. Yeah, yeah. You know what page So it that seems to hold. Uh, that's, uh, oh, hold on here. And I brought it up at the yeah uh, first first selected messages first selected messages three six three it's in a really nice compilation it was very popular in the eighties you probably remember it the preparation for the final crisis yep. Fernando C yeah that's yeah it's got a lot of good quotes in there in one place okay and the page in what was the page again. And selected uh, three, yeah, three, six, three. Okay. three, six, three. Yeah, yeah. I need to remember that one so that I can quote it. And that is that is the beginning of the loud cry is the topic there, right? So and that's from God's review and, work in the chapter, and that's yeah, and that's from uh, the review and Herald, November twenty second. And uh, November twenty second is important um, in that that's the the date uh, when we have that uh, on the 15th day of the eighth month that Jeroboam, the prophecy of, of Josiah is going to be given when Jeroboam's offering on the off altar in Baal. And that's uh, November 22nd, 977 BC. Um, but it's also interesting if you take the rabbinic date and you go to the Gregorian date, it's October 13th, 977. So it's kind of a couple of steps there. So November 22nd represents uh, the midnight cry is my point. <laughs> and it's the beginning of the loud cry uh, is the title for that in uh, first selected messages. And it, and it says, yeah, so let every one who claims to believe the Lord is soon coming search the scriptures as never before. For Satan is determined to try every device possible to keep souls in darkness and blind the minds, mind to the perils of the times in which we are living. Let every believer take up his Bible with earnest prayer that he may be enlightened by the Holy Spirit as to what is true, that he may know more of God and of Jesus whom he has sent. Right? Search for the truth as for hidden treasures and disappoint the enemy. Uh, the time of test is just upon us. For the loud cry of the third angel has already begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ as in pardoning Redeemer. This is the beginning of the light of the angel whose glory shall fill the whole earth. Right. So, so this is actually, so this is actually a different quote. Yeah, I'm trying to find. It. I don't see that actual statement that you read here on this page. Was the, it parag parag <clears throat> the paragraph begins. So you could search. Time of test. Yeah, okay. The time of test is just upon us. Okay, yeah, it is in there. I just didn't keep keep reading. Yeah. For it is the work of everyone to whom the message of warning has come to lift up Jesus, to present to him 
as revealed in types, as shadows as as in symbols, as manifested in the revelations of the prophets, as unveiled in the lessons given to his disciples, and in the wonderful miracles wrought for the sons of men. Search the scriptures, for they are they that testify of him. If you would stand through the time of trouble, you must know Christ and appropriate the gift of his righteousness, which he imputes to the repentant sinner. I mean, it's just amazing what God's doing right now, I think, um, in in what he has unfolded to us. And and I'm gonna uh, go on, once I get back to Canada, I'll be able to share some of this stuff a little bit more because I can put some of this stuff up on the screen, some of the diagrams. Uh, dealing with this uh, be easier to do, but but it is quite amazing. Um, at least what what God's been teaching me, <laughs> I find is um, you know for me to be here in Australia and uh, have some of the experiences that I've had, it, it definitely has changed my perspective. It's given me a new view of things, and and hopefully people you know will be able to see that. It, should be able to come out in what we've been doing. But anyway, that's, that's you know, sort of tying up that's, what... Uh, uh, you know, I just sent that's, in the chat Yeah, a, connect, a connected quote. This is uh, 5 Testimony 206-207. Here is the nature yeah. of the work of the people of God. They have a message of so great importance that they are represented as flying in the presentation of it to the world. They are holding in their hands the bread of life for a famishing world. The love of Christ constraineth them. This is the last message. There are no more to follow, no more invitations of mercy to be given after this message. It'll have done its work. What is the last message then? Message of mercy? Yeah, the offer of mercy. And and I believe that that's what this message is. I mean, what, what God has given this movement that has been rejected by the vast majority of the movement because they don't understand it, right? They they rejected it. And and the reason that people reject the light is because it reveals to them their sins. It reveals to them a cross, something that people are unwilling to bear. And and we all know that. We all understand how we don't want that cross, how contrary it is to Mm -hmm. our nature. And so when people reject light, they go into darkness. What, what is manifest is, is man's character. Right? That's what we see happening in the world, within the church, within this movement, is that either we are sanctified by the truth, by accepting it and allowing it to do its work, to have the experience of the, the first, second, and third angels' messages in our life. Or we reject that law. Like, and we go into darkness, and, and our characters become manifest. And we don't want to have our characters become manifest, right? Mm. And, and the ironic thing is we hide in the darkness because we don't want to have our characters manifest, right? It, but, but they're going to be manifest because mm-hmm. what's in the darkness is going to be brought into the light one way or yeah. another. So I would rather that my character, which is very unchristlike, that is is a reflection of my human nature, my sin. I would rather bring that to Christ now, to his light, to his love, to his gospel, to his grace, to be cleansed and to be fashioned anew so that I reflect the character of Christ, than to have my character manifest to the world for all to see. You know, the one amazing thing to me is all of us are sinners. We all recognize that Mm. there are things in us that are so dark that we never want anyone to know or to see in us. Right? I don't know that I don't know that we all recognize that. um, Some more than others, perhaps, because the message, the last message of mercy, is a message of repentance and faith toward God. But, so, but we all have we all have it's only we, only those that repent can really see the darkness of their character well, yeah but but we all have things we don't want people to know right yeah we, we have all have our skeletons yeah 
I mean, we're ashamed of, you know, everybody has that. I mean, that's why we fight against the light. Now, yeah, we don't see it in its fullness because we're, we're trying to hide it. We sometimes hide it from ourselves. I agree. But you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Full well. So, yeah, yeah. And, and, but we can go to Christ now with all of our sins. And those sins will forever be removed, so much so that we can't even remember them. I mean, that mm-hmm. is what salvation is about. And God offers us that. Mm-hmm. He offers us purity of heart, the cleansing of the conscience from sins. Right? That, you know, animal sacrifices can't make the sinner the, the, the offer uh, perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Right? Because there's still a remembrance made of sins every year. That's Hebrews chapter 9. But we know that at the end of the world, Christ can uh, cleanse our conscience from dead works to serve a living God. So to have our conscience cleansed, to wash with pure water, you know, it, it, it is such, such an amazing gift that we are hardly even aware of. Because what people want, what the world wants, is I want my sins forgiven. Right? We want pardon. We want to be able to speed in our car and the police officer not give us a ticket. Right? That's what we want. But God is offering something more than just pardon. He's offering a transformation of our characters. And the means by which that can occur is something that is based upon light that God has been giving Seventh-day Adventists, been giving this movement, and many will not receive the light. And they don't realize that it is a saving message. Now, so we talked about, you know, what is a testing truth. All truth is testing, but it's all progressive. Yeah. We, we have to say yeah. that the first yeah. angel's message is part of that test, right? Now, we are not the ones judging, and we're not the ones testing anybody. And we're not, we're not going yeah. to people and say, we, we have the testing message, and you need to accept this message, or else, you know, you're going to be lost. You know, I mean, we can present the scriptures or, to anyone. Or telling, that. What? Or telling others that, that, that we, are, we have arrived, and now you guys need to come follow us. Like, I, you know, all our sins are forgiven now, and I'm, I've reached perfection, and that's another. It's just an error that people go off on, yeah. because it is a message of of God's changing, changing us. Right. So, yeah. so we present the truth in the scriptures as God has revealed to them to us as individuals. We never present it as a testing message, because we are not the one who's who's doing the testing. It's God. Right. Yeah, and we know that, the and they may reject way. the message coming. People can reject a message coming from this person, but when they hear it from a different person at the different time, I don't know. God's timing is perfect, so some right. you know how many I mean, times, how many chances, what? how many chances does He give? He gives chances until there's no more re- need, reason to give another chance. The and, mercy and of God endureth them. forever, but without presumption. That's where people trip, right? Is the presumption? But yeah, and we. Just knowing, yeah, we don't having that to... assurance of mercy, it, it's a big thing, right? Having the assurance of mercy. That that but keeps us from coming to, to the light. Yeah. And we don't want to make that mistake that many people make. Light comes to them, and it's light, you know. Sometimes yeah. it isn't. But um, whatever comes to them, they think that everybody has to know that somehow they are God's appointed mm. messengers. And they are now yeah. giving the testing message. And and usually it goes off into fanaticism and error, right? Because Every they're, time. they're not really truly. Yeah, yeah. But we know that, that that's not the message that God is giving us. The message that he is giving us first is to us. And any light that God gives us is light. And we, and we can share it to whoever. But to, to share that as if we have all of the light and that this is the tested message for the day, even when it may be true, <laughs> who knows, right? Um, mm-hmm. But that is not our message that we are giving the testing message. Our message is just 
to follow what God has given us day by day and to allow the Holy Spirit to do this work because God is going to take the work into his own hands. He doesn't place it in our hands. I mean, he does, right? We have the work to do. But it's going to be evident that it's not the work of man, that it's the work of God. And we have to trust that that God is going to do something that we can't. If we looked at this work, what needs to be done, we really understood it. It's way beyond any of us. It's even beyond I have all of us. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I have looked yeah. at it. And, and, and to have a concept of, of it going global, like fire in a stubble, that's what I imagine happening. And, yeah, it's not yeah. going to happen by a new program or an, another re- seminar or something. It's going to – and it won't come from leadership. All only. Well, I mean, all of us, each member has to be able to – yeah, so, so we do the part that God has given us, right? We're connected to Christ the head, and Christ will organize the body, and this work will happen in a way that it will be evident. One is, if you look mm-hmm. at what well, we're doing, we're nobodies, and, you know, we don't have the skills necessary to, to do this work. I mean, so if we really imagined, and, and, and I see people do it all the time. I mean, and I would say they have less skills than us, not that we have great skills, but, you know, people who really, you know, they don't reflect Christ's character in, in any sort of stretch of the imagination. Uh, they're very argumentative, mm. debative, defensive. Uh, mm. They got a bunch of crazy ideas, and they think they have the message for this time. And, and they're just individuals, mm-hmm. right? Because they had some vision or some good thing God showed them. And, and they think that they are the instrument that God is going to use, that we have to accept that they're a prophet or something, right? I mean, I run into yeah. individuals like this all the time, and they're making such a great error, and we can't make that error. Just because we know that God has given us light, amazing light in this study, uh, to imagine that we are the ones bringing the testing message. It's God who's going to bring the test to all. And what our responsibility is to respond to the life that God has given us. Are we going to reflect Christ's character? Mm. Or, or are we going to allow... The individuals, individuals running running ahead of God with, with what they believe is a message that they have to give to everybody. Now that... that uh, oh shoot, I had a thought there on that. That uh, the, the wonderful manifestation of the glory of God we, I don't know. I think I think we we can people can make a mistake thinking that it's a message of certain ideas and words that give it its power. But what gives it the power is the wonderful manifestation of the glory of God. Is a wonderful manifestation in my mind of the character of God in in the lives of the messengers, and that's what gives it the power because they can see that no matter what they say or do, we love them. Because we see they're they're a soul, and and to be to be able to relate to every person that I come in contact with in a redeeming manner, and, and with graciousness and kindness, no matter how bad of a day they're having, it turns the whole thing around, and that that's just a small thing in our daily interactions. Now, mm-hmm. but the, yeah, when that character is really ours that's powerful i've had conversations with people sometimes and i am another where i'm talking with them and i can just see their face lighting up and their eye contact can't break away because i'm telling them something about truth and they don't know that i'm preaching to them <laughs> it's just so neat when it happens and that's going to happen on a world scale all the time until Christ comes. And it, and it happens as we are broken and we're dependent upon God and we're not exalting ourselves. Right. See, the only way it can happen. Right? Yeah. The experience of Isaiah being made in the dust. It's the only way God can use us to give that message. And we have to A have that example. coal from the altar, that live coal from the altar touching our lips. Mm-hmm. Okay. 
Mr. Dwight? Yeah. I yes. think we covered that time as well. So we can go on. It's interesting when we look at this, especially about the children of the robbers of thy people in the alternate reading. This word is also translated as destroyer in Psalms 17.4 and in Isaiah 35.9 as ravenous and and it's also coupled with beast. But in Jeremiah 7.11, Ezekiel 7.22, and Ezekiel 18.10, they are translated as robbers. So in this, in this portion, we have that in those times, there shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also, the robbers of thy people, or the ravenous, the destroyers of thy people, shall exalt themselves to establish, as we are saying, the vision, the calzone, that concerns the daily and the transgression of desolation, or the seven times. Right, because um, if you add uh, H1121, that is the sons, right, right. instead of children, uh, plus H6530, that is the word robbers, you get that 7651, which is Shiva, and that's the word in Leviticus 26 that's translated as seven times. Right. So, so yeah, so this is, you know, kind of where we started last week, or not last week, yesterday, right, in, in putting this together. But we we know that to establish the vision, the kazon, um, that we need, we need this message about Rome has to be there, right? Correct. Um, both in uh, pagan and papal Rome. Right? So this, so this, that, that kazone is that vision of Daniel seven, right? Babylon, Medo Persia, and Greece, Rome, pagan, Rome, papal. Um, you know, with the little horn and uh, bringing us all up to the judgment and everything, right? So the kazone is th- this big vision, right? This this period of time. But it doesn't just, you know, end in 1863, right? You know, if you, if, or, or in 1798 or where, wherever you want. And because it does end with the judgment, right? Not, and, and maybe we could say to the start of the judgment uh, to some degree, but also to the end of that. So um, the, if you, Daniel 7, yeah. The point from the margin reading, the children of the robbers, is yeah, it should be sons. I don't know why they put children when it's sons, but anyway. Okay, the sons of the robbers are. Is this denoting those apostates that refuse the message of warning? Okay, so you're trying to make an application to our time. Yes. No, it represents the papacy in our history. I haven't quite noticed that before uh, the children of the robbers, sons of the robbers. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, well, it doesn't doesn't say it in the King James. That's part of the problem. It doesn't? In the King James, it doesn't translate their sons. It just says the robbers are black people. But if you you look in the sword, you'll see there's two words there. Ben, Ben. Which means a son, right? I'm not sure why they translate it in in, in uh, alternate reading marginal as children because it's sons. And then of course, uh, peretz is this word robber. That is it means violent. It comes from the word violent. It is a tyrant, destroyer, ravenous, robber. And but together added, they add up to seven uh, seven six five one which is uh, Hebrew 7651 is the word seven times in Leviticus 26. So uh, so that's pretty mm. profound, right? 
Well, who are um, these sons, sons of the robbers? Well, well, well this is just that's that's Rome. That's just it's just a reference to to pagan Rome. That's not just a pagan. No, in in Daniel eleven fourteen, it's just a reference to pagan Rome, not to the papacy. It it only applies to the papacy in our application because in the context here, it is addressing okay. that okay. Rome has to exalt itself. Now Rome is the fourth kingdom, so I mean you could say it includes pa papacy, but in the context here, it's pagan Rome that exalts itself to establish the vision, but they shall fall, and we we can apply it, you know. I guess to the papacy if we really wanted to, but the way that we had applied it was to pagan Rome, because it's, it's going to describe the fall right, to, of pagan so Rome the, and in the, the following the, verses. Their uh, thy people shall exalt themselves. So to establish the vision is uh, okay. So is establishing the vi is there exalting themselves, establishing the vision. Yeah. You know so, what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. The the exalt the exalting of pagan Rome establishes the vision. Proves right? the vision? What's that word Rome, establish? Well, it just means stand up. Okay. To stand, right? All of these different kingdoms stand. You're first gonna have, you know, uh Babylon stands and then Medo Persia stands up and then uh, Greece stands up, right? All these different people stand up. You know, it's the same mm -hmm. word, and at those times, be many stand up against the king of the south, right? So, so again, that's just another. St so they could have said, uh, the robbers of the people shall, and this word exalt themselves, that is lift up themselves to stand up, but, you know, to exalt themselves to stand up the vision, right? To, to have the vision stand up. But, but the idea is that it stands is up it to establish. To, to for this vision, right? So Rome has to stand up. They have to exalt themselves is in it, order for this vision to stand up. Right? There's a so sense this, this, there that establishing the vision, uh, proving true the vision, bringing to pass the prophecy, establishing the prophecy, establishing the vision. Yeah, yeah, kind yeah. Of, that, that's what, sure, what has yeah. to happen. So without Rome, you, you don't have the vision being completed. Right? Because there's, there's four fully, kings. Fully Babylon, shown. What? Well, fully shown or established as, uh, I don't know. It, it's like to be set in, without. To be set in place. Yeah. Proven true. Uh, yeah. Set in yeah. place. Yeah. In the framework of truth. Well, be, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, to be to be set up. Establishing right? the vision. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Now, so the word, you know, to stand is literally what it is, Hamad, right? Um, now, it can be literally and figuratively and transitively and transitively. So it can be abide, behind, appoint, arise, cease, confirm, continue, dwell. So it all depends on the context. The idea here, you know, if you translate it as stand up the vision, that doesn't really make sense in English. And so the idea is that it's established, it's being set in place. It mean place, raise up, remain. And it's also in context of exalt, right? So they're going to exalt themselves, nasa, that is to lift, right? And again, a great variety of applications. So... So they're going to exalt themselves to establish the vision. That's Rome in this context, right? Because it's going to describe all of what pagan Rome is doing. It's not going to describe what papal Rome is doing. Um, but it's going to apply to papal Rome ultimately because papal Rome is a continuation of pagan Rome. But papal Rome is going to, pagan Rome is going to fall. And, and so when we went through these verses, we saw how that all connected in the transition from pagan to papal Rome, right? So, and that's going to deal with, you know, when you get to verse uh, uh, 31, right? In, in the arm shall stand on his part. That word stand again is exalt, right? Shall pollute the sanctuary of strength and shall take away the daily and shall place the abomination that maketh desolate, right? So that's 
taking away the daily and the set, setting up of the papacy. Okay, so so we didn't get very far as far as the study, but um, so Dwight, yes. Um, so you know, we're looking at Uriah Smith's thoughts on Daniel, and and so I'm going to ask you the question. Uh, so what's what's the significance that that Daniel is missing here? I mean. Or not Daniel, but uh, your high Smith. Uh, what what is he missing? He, does he understand fully even what it means that Rome exalts itself to establish the vision based on what he writes here? Not at all. Yeah. Well, okay, because he's going to talk about like the breakers of my people. Let's see here, I'm going to have to switch over to this. Right. So he's going to quote uh, Bishop Newton. Right. I mean, the, the right. situation. So he's gonna talk yeah. So he's going to talk about Rome, pagan Rome. Yeah, go on. The situation with Smith in this portion is that he is focused on the historic, literal application. He is not choosing to look at anything regarding present truth. Well, yeah. But but as far as the historical application, he does understand that it's Rome that exalts itself to establish the vision. Correct. Okay. But he just doesn't know what the vision is. Correct. Yeah. He doesn't understand that it's it's something that he rejected, uh, the 2520. Because we're saying that the Kazom is the 2520. The Mare is the 2300 days. Correct. The bar is seventy weeks, and the mar the mara is the looking glass vision. It's the whole prophetic mirror, everything all put together that reflects Christ, that exalts Christ in types and symbols and so forth, so that we can reflect Christ's character. Yeah. Agreed. Okay. There's there is a lot that Smith presents but does not understand because his his vision is entirely skewed because of his rejection of the seven signs. Yeah. But, you know, we, to be fair, we know that the, the 2520 is hidden, right, you know, on the 1863 chart. And so his inability to see something that God has his hand over, I mean, part of it is God's hands over it because of the condition of the church. But, you know, there was no way that he could have seen it, right, with, with with the situation the way it was. God hid it so that it could be seen now, right? I mean, it doesn't mean Uriah Smith doesn't have a bunch of faults and that he should have seen should have seen it if he had the Spirit of God. But those are, are you know, ifs. But we now have no excuse, right? Well, Eugene Pruitt, when he, does, when he doesn't see it, his sin is greater than Uriah Smith's because he, he begins to see it, but because of the rejection of the church in the past, he's not going to truly consider it, right? Okay. That, that's, the, that's the mistake of, of, of Eugene Pruitt, which, which I think is a greater sin. So we are now at the end of the world. God has removed his hand from the 1863 chart. And we sh- should be able to see the 2520 and the prophetic mirror. We should be able to see the mara, or mara, pardon me, right? The looking glass vision. And, and the fact that Eugene Pruitt can see it, that to me is disappointing, as I said. Very disappointed that. Um, but Uriah Smith has an excuse, but that doesn't really matter. What, what matters is that we can see now what Uriah Smith couldn't see. The difference is that we are willing more to examine Scripture just as it reads. Smith was choosing through his own bias to reject what was plainly in front of him. Yeah. And and we have to be not like Uriah Smith. Correct. Now, we have reached the end of our time together today.
any other comments or questions for today? Well, I, um, you know, so tomorrow is is uh, Thursday for you guys, right? So that's the last Correct. day this week. And then, uh, you know, I won't be there for the Friday night study. I won't be there for the Sabbath study. I should be there for the Sunday morning study. Uh, I'm, I'm going to miss quite a bit next week, which is okay, but because uh, I'll be traveling some of that, but uh, that time. Um, but yeah, I will, uh, next Thursday, I will be back in Canada. So that would be nice to be able to join study there on Thursday. So I think I'll catch, I might catch Sunday and Monday next week and then Thursday. So it'll be two, two days, Tuesday and Wednesday. I won't be able to join in. Okay. So, um, but yeah, I, and, and then when I get home, I'm going to have a lot of work putting this together. I'm trying to do some of it here, but I, I'm pretty busy for the next while because I'm going to be visiting uh, William Pitt. And uh, so so there's going to be some interesting. Yeah. Say hi to say hi to William for me. It's been a, been a while. Okay. Yeah, I'll say hi. Yeah. So I'm going to be with him for a few days before I come back. So Sabbath. Um, you know, Saturday night he's going to pick me up, and I'm going to be at his place Sunday, Monday, and then Tuesday I fly out. So, anyway, so I guess you can close in prayer now. Late. Okay. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we've been able to spend together. We thank you for your guidance and your leadership in the conversation and the study that we've had. We ask now, Father, for your blessing and your watch care through this day. Be with us, each one. Direct us, Father, so that your character may be shown to all with whom we come in contact. Help us to carefully consider these things. Bring us back together again for our studies and our worship of you. For this we thank you. For this we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.